Hello, and welcome, or welcome back, to this ongoing series, Autism Spectrum Disorder in Three Dimensions. My name is James Copeland, MD, and I will be your guide to this material. Over the past several weeks, we've reviewed the contributions of Langdon Down, a 19th century physician, who gave the first lucid and fairly complete description of autism uh, in 1887, although he didn't use the word autism. Uh, we went on from there to talk about the contributions of Leo Connor, MD, a child psychiatrist at Johns Hopkins in Baltimore, who published a landmark paper in 1943 entitled Autistic Disturbances of Affective Contact. From there, we moved on to talk about Hans Asperger, MD, an Austrian physician who published a paper in German in 1944 entitled Autistic Psychopathology in Children. This paper remained largely unknown to the English-speaking world until the 1990s. We also spoke somewhat briefly of George Frankel, MD, and his wife Annie Weiss, a psychologist, who actually were two of Hans Asperger's teachers who fled from Nazi Europe to the United States and were employed by Leo Connor and actually did the, the uh, write-up of Leo Connor's first patient with autism. So George Frankel and Annie Weiss are the missing link uh, in between Hans Asperger and Leo Connor. We'll have a bit more to say about uh, George Frankel in a few weeks. But today, what I'd like to do is tie together some of the material that we've uh, discussed in the past several weeks and kind of synthesize where we are so far. I'd like to begin by making a uh, distinction between two terms that are used uh, by developmental pediatricians, delay and atypicality. And we'll talk about delay in a future post as well in distinction to atypicality. So Development that's delayed refers to something that would be normal if it were occurring in a younger child. For example, if a child begins walking at 18 months or 24 months, and on examination that child has normal muscle tone and normal reflexes, we would say that the child has gross motor delay. On the other hand, a typical development refers to some sort of developmental pattern that would be abnormal at any age. So if we see a child who has muscle stiffness and arching of the back and involuntary movements, regardless of whether they're walking or not, we would have to consider that as atypical and clearly off the tracks because it's not a developmental pattern that we normally see at any age. And if we now use that term atypical in that sense, meaning um, something that would not be encountered at any age in the usual run of things, and now we go back and look at what Langdon Down and Leo Connor and Hans Osberger had to say and try to pull those threads together, what we come up with is four distinct domains. I know the DSM has boiled it down to three, that's another story, but if we look at uh, what Down, Connor, and Asperger had to say, we're talking about four domains. The first is impaired social contact, and both Leo Connor and George Frankel use the term affective contact, and we will be talking in more detail about a paper written by Frankel in a few sessions. So impaired social or affective contact is a prime uh, expression of spectrum disorder. And now I'd like to introduce a couple of technical terms. One that you may have heard of or may not have heard of is the term theory of mind. Now this is not a term that was used by Down, Connor, or Asperger, but they, they talked about things that we now believe may be reflective of some impairment in theory of mind. And what that means is the ability to infer somebody else's mental state. So if I see you tapping your toe or looking away, 
Maybe you're bored with me. Maybe you're angry. If I see you leaning forward on the edge of your seat, more likely you're interested in what I have to say and so forth. So a lot of this has to do with body language, but also things like tone of voice, context. It's the ability to get inside somebody else's head or at least have a good shot at figuring out how somebody else is taking something. The second area universally described is that of impaired language. And I'm going to throw another couple of technical terms at you. Again, these are not terms that were known to Down, Connor, or Asperger, but they certainly described the features. And the first term is pragmatics. To be pragmatic is the same root as to be practical. So pragmatics refers to the use of language as a tool for interacting with other people. And it includes things like framing. In other words, if I suddenly started talking about um, the Hawaiian Islands with no framing, you would be a little baffled because it would be a jump in subject. But if I said to you, you know, instead of doing this blog post about autism, I just came back from Hawaii. Not true, really, but for the sake of discussion, if I were to say, I just came back from Hawaii and I just really want to talk to you about my vacation, I've kind of framed the subject instead of jump cutting to something that has nothing to do with what you were expecting me to be talking about. Whereas, as we know, or as you may know, people uh, with spectrum disorder will often jump into a topic, typically their favorite topic, whatever that is, and just start going on and on without giving you any clue as to why they're talking about it or even giving you a turn, which comes to one of the other issues with uh, difficulty with pragmatics is turn taking. And there are other manifestations, but they all funnel into the feeling uh, that the person with spectrum disorder is talking at you, not with you. And then there's prosody, which is a technical term that refers to tone, pitch, and inflection. And the uh, manner of speaking of people with autism has sometimes been described as sing-song, sometimes it's too loud, sometimes it's robotic, but various disturbances of prosody. So uh, language impairment includes impaired pragmatics and impaired prosody. And once you've heard those, you can generally pick them out fairly quickly. The third domain is repetitious behaviors and interests. And uh, Langdon Down spoke about one of the people uh, under his care who built incredibly detailed ship's models but was barely verbal. Uh, I've had patients who've memorized uh, the subway system, having never been to New York, but they know all the stops, uh, and so on. And then fourth are sensory motor abnormalities. And these include unusual attractions or aversions to various classes of sensory stimuli. Temple Grandin, whose name you may recognize uh, as an individual on the spectrum, built a squeeze machine for herself to uh, meet her craving for, for the pressure that the squeeze machine provides. On the other side of the coin, um, some of my patients with spectrum disorder were terrified of the vacuum cleaner or the noise made by hand dryers in a public washroom. And then clumsiness, and nobody knows really what the link is between clumsiness and spectrum disorder, although there's some very exciting work going on with uh, mirror neurons and the ability to imitate somebody motorically, and that does seem to be linked to theory of mind, and we'll spend some time talking about that down the road as well. But for now, on a thumbnail, impaired social interaction, impaired language, repetitious behaviors and interests, and sensory motor issues. And those are the four areas that we consider uh, to be all represented in people on the spectrum. So now we're going to take those four areas on the left, those domains, social, language, repetitive thoughts and behaviors, and sensory motor, and then we're going to run a scale across uh, the top of severity, decreasing severity from severe to moderate to mild. And within the social domain, at its most severe, uh, is the individual who can't be engaged at all. It's uh, as if they were totally in another world. We don't exist in their perception as far as we can tell. I had one uh, mother who uh, said to me, uh, does my child know that we love him? Uh, another mom said to me, 
For the nine months that I was pregnant, I've been waiting to meet him. He's four years old now, and I still don't feel as if I've met him. And uh, again, a heart-rending description, but a very apt uh, way of capturing the fact that the child simply cannot be engaged, has no imitative behavior. I think I quoted uh, one of the previous weeks, the mom who said to me, our child lives among us, but not with us. That sense of being uh, in their own little world, which is actually a phrase that um, I think all three, uh, uh, Connor, um, Asperger, and Down, all used phrases like that. Somebody who's not as severely affected may be engageable with difficulty, frequently after prolonged delay, and you can occasionally get them to imitate you, but it's um, touch and go and after a delay. And then at the mildest end are individuals who are easily engaged, but they have persistent difficulty with social reciprocity. And uh, some of these are um, quotes, high functioning individuals who have all of the academic skills and technical skills um, to be gainfully employed, but what they lack is the lunchroom skills uh, to know how to get along with their fellow employees. And, and that's something that's uh, really hard to deal with. In terms of language, at uh, the most severe end are individuals with no functional communication of any kind, <clears throat> then in the kind of middle zone are individuals who have some degree of functional communication. They may uh, uh, indicate their wants by taking their parent's hand and guiding the parent hand over hand. They may use manual signs, in other words, signs uh, that are used also with uh, deaf individuals. Or they may use stock phrases, but they use the stock phrases in a particular context. In other words, um, and this is an example out of Connor's paper, the father said to his son Donald, who at that point was on daddy's shoulders, you want to get down? And Donald wanted to get down. So Donald said, get down, echoing his father. But from then on, for Donald, the phrase, want to get down, was his way of saying yes. That phrase took on the meaning of yes, because within that original context, context he had meant it to say yes. Uh, and likewise, echolalia in context, uh, and then finally, there are individuals who have good functional communication. They can tell you what they want, they can tell you uh, what they need, and so forth. But they have difficulty with what are called theory of mind tasks. For example, humor, the ability to tell a joke, uh, to misdirect the listener, uh, requires the, the joke teller to, to be able to read the um, the sense of his uh, victim to be, to know how, how to most successfully misdirect the victim uh, and then deliver the punchline with maximal effect. Or sarcasm, or make-believe. I had one patient on the spectrum, and every time his sister engaged in make-believe, my patient would run to his parents and say, Mommy, Susie is lying again, because this uh, child on the spectrum could not distinguish between lying versus make-believe. He had been told, always tell the truth, but he was quite literal about that, and uh, make-believe did not fall within the scope of telling the truth, so he really had a hard time. Repetitive thoughts and behaviors. These can include stereotypies, flapping and spinning, things like that, or uh, insisting on always going around the neighborhood in a particular direction, lining up toys, spinning of objects, and so forth. And these can be intense and all-consuming when the child is very young. Um, if the individual is less severely affected, then they can accept a verbal preparation for change in routine, and they may engage in some socially appropriate play, not simply lining up blocks. And then at the mildest end are individuals who have no physical stereotypies, and their repetitious behavior may take the form of some sort of intense uh, preoccupation. And then finally, there are sensory motor uh, features, including attempts, attra attractions to or aversions to various sensory inputs, uh, children who can't stand a certain smell, or who, on the other hand, gravitate to certain uh, olfactory or tactile or visual stimuli, uh, or these can exist in various uh, intensities, uh, clumsiness likewise. 
So these can, any of these can occur on a uh, gradation of severity. And we're going to lump all of these together for the sake of discussion. I know they're, each is different and you can have any degree of severity in any one area independently of the other areas. But for the sake of discussion, we're going to put all of these under the umbrella term of atypicality. And, as certainly Connor and Asperger pointed out, Langdon Down not so much. It's a shame he didn't go back uh, in 1887 and follow up on the children he had first observed in 1855. But certainly Connor and Asperger described improvement over time. And this was without treatment, because in those days there was no treatment. And of course, one of the uh, pregnant questions uh, uh, today is, to what extent is my child better because of the natural history of the condition? In other words, the tendency for spectrum disorder to improve over time. And to what extent is my child more better? Awkward grammar, but scientifically the correct question. To what extent is my child more better because of whatever intervention he's had? And I think it's worth revi revisiting what Leo Connor had to say. Between the ages of five and six, he wrote, they, meaning his 11 patients with autism, gradually abandon echolalia and learn spontaneously to use personal pronouns. Language becomes more communicative, at first in the sense of a question and answer exercise, and then in the sense of greater spontaneity of sentence formation. Food is accepted without difficulty. Noises and motions are tolerated more than previously. The panic tantrums subside. The repetitiousness assumes the form of obsessive preoccupations. Reading skill is acquired quickly, but the children read monotonously, and a story or moving picture is experienced in unrelated portions rather than in its coherent totality. And we're going to talk about central coherence in a few weeks. Between the ages of six and eight, the children begin to play in a group, still never with the other members of the group, but at least on the periphery alongside the group. People are included in the child's world to the extent to which they satisfy his needs. And Connor concludes, all of this makes the family feel that in spite of recognized quote-unquote difference from other children, there is progress and improvement. And indeed there is. So we can take our table of atypical features. And if we pay attention to the label across the top of decreasing atypicality, we can replace that with an axis that says decreasing atypicality and or increasing age. And what is Casey Stengel doing in a lecture about autism? Well, just this. Casey Stengel once famously said to the team, line up alphabetically by height. And although it was impossible, I don't know if it was the Yankees or the Mets that he said this to, somebody can write in and tell me, it is possible in terms of spectrum disorder to do something like that because we can talk about progression over time or uh, reduced intensity of symptoms and they both progress from left to right. So here we have all of these features of atypicality with either decreasing atypicality or increasing age across the top. And we can do this. What we've done for the sake of building a model is to kind of blenderize all of those features together. And now we create an axis that starts with severe at the far left, moderate in the middle, mild at the right. And then you'll notice this very porous uh, boundary. I deliberately put a dotted line there because somewhere over here is the mythical normal. And in fact, there is no sharp boundary between spectrum disorder and normal. And nowhere is this more evident a lot of the time than uh, when one looks at the siblings and the parents of the child with identified spectrum disorder because uh, Connor described this 
uh, Asperger described this, that a lot of times the same traits that are present in the child are evident to lesser or greater extent in the parents. Now, uh, here's a painting by Payet Mondrian. He was a, a modernist painter uh, several decades ago now. You may recognize this style of painting. And the DSM rests on the uh, inaccurate premise that we can draw little boxes around things. And we can't because uh, spectrum dis Mother Nature doesn't work like this. So autism spectrum disorder is not in a neat little box like a Mondrian painting. Rather, Mother Nature paints with a broad brush and in watercolors. And this, of course, is a painting uh, by uh, Claude Monet of the Water Lilies from 1893. And if you look closely, you can see the letters ASD kind of superimposed over the pond. And in some places you can see a clear border, but in other places like over here, it's virtually impossible to separate the lettering from the background. And that's really the way it is. So tying this all together, clinical features are in four domains, social, language, repetitive behavior, and sensory motor. They can exist in any degree of severity from severe to mild. There's improvement over time, irrespective of treatment. And there's no sharp border between mild atypicality and normal. But clearly, some children uh, progress further than others, and there are reasons for that. And we're going to talk more about that next time, because what I want you to begin thinking about is spectrum disorder as being like a chunk of ice floating in the water, and the water temperature being the IQ. And this is a concept that we're going to develop a little bit more, or actually a lot more, next time and in the weeks that follow. Well, there you have it. Thanks for hanging in there. It was uh, not the marathon post uh, that last week's was, but there was still a lot to digest. You can follow up on some of this by going to my website, and I put the link up on the screen. And uh, if you choose to, you can also buy my book. I'm not here to hawk the book, but uh, the book does go into this, and you can find out more about that on the website. I'll see you next week. Thanks for stopping by.